let me introduce uh, Ashok. I mean, since he has already spilled the beans by saying we know each other from 1984, but let me share certain formal details about him. Uh, he's a distinguished professor emeritus at University of California, Berkeley. And he was also a faculty senior scientist at uh, Lawrence Berkeley Lab, where I met him a, uh, three, four times, yeah, a few times, okay? What he did recently was uh, something which triggered uh, an award for him. So on 24th October 23, he was honored at the White House by the President of US of A, uh, President Biden, with the National Medal of Technology and Innovation, which is US's highest award. Okay. Yeah. He's known for many innovations that he will talk about, but I'll point out one specific one. But before that, he did his master's in, uh, from IIT Kanpur, and then later the PhD in physics from uh, UC Berkeley, and then he stayed on there. But he came briefly to India, uh, and he was working in Terry, that is where we met uh, each other first. And uh, it was, uh, we hit it out pretty well because some of our discussions uh, uh, spanned over, for example, I'll go uh, to the hotel he was staying at 10.30 in the night after finishing my meetings, then we will discuss till about 3 o'clock in the morning and then I'll drop him to the airport, come back to Orissa Bhavan and sleep like a log. So uh, ma many interesting discussions. But one relevant point uh, today is that we tried unsuccessfully uh, propagating a UV water filter way back in 1985 in Orissa. And that probably taught him quite a few interesting lessons why technology doesn't disseminate in our system. And this was probably the beach of his efforts in developmental uh, engineering. And very recently, he with uh, a couple of his colleagues uh, brought out a book e-book essentially from Springer on development engineering, which uh, initially when it uh, hit about, uh, about 40,000 downloads, we said, wow. It crossed 50,000, we said, wow, wow. And then uh, it crossed 1 lakh, uh, 80,000, that is 90,000, that's the last uh, one I heard. So how many wow, wow, wows you can calculate that, okay? So without much ado, I think I'll invite Ashok. I have heard his talks uh, absolutely delightful, so I'm sure you'll be able to enjoy that as well. So over to Ashok. Thank you very much. Okay, here we go. Since the title is over ambitious and time is short, allow me to Allow me to cut out the middle part which says my journey. Because that's kind of autobiographical, is less, least interesting of the three parts. So I'll start by describing what's development engineering and what it is not. And give just two examples. Kind of bookends to my, uh, almost bookends. One is a little bit after I started working on, in the field back in 1985. 1995, and then the second one is the work I did maybe in 2016-17. There are uh, efforts done before and after these bookend parts as well, and a lot of stuff in between. But for you, what is interesting and is to, to basically ask, so what does it mean? What are your learnings? What is your takeaway? That's, I hope, is of interest to you. And what is of interest to me for sure is your pushback and your questions and your challenging uh, ideas that I want to present to you. And some of those ideas you may not agree with, some of them you will say, God knows what this guy is talking about, but let's see how it goes. Okay? So, first of all, the word engineering is not based on the word engines. Okay? is something I learned much later after I started doing this. It turns out that the word engineering is based on the word ingenuity or ingenious, ingenious. And it predates very substantially any kind of modern engines. 
So I used to think that engineers is the guy with the screwdriver who keeps the engine running, you know? That's not the case. It's the guy who's ingenious, guys and girls, who are ingenious who solve problems, who solve hard problems, which the rest of society kind of looks to them to solve. So that's the signature thing about engineers. His is not about engines, it's about solving hard problems. That's, look it up. It was, uh, comes from Middle English before there were any modern engines. And uh, there is a French route and so on. So it's manipulation of matter, energy, and information to advance human goals, to advance human intentionality. And like my friend, uh, Kentaro Toyama likes to say, all technology is about human intentionality. There may be some unintentional consequences for sure, but the key thing is, is not going to go in the direction that you do not intend to go. You're going to shape it to deliver human intentionality, okay? And that's why, to much to my regret, a lot of engineers, a big majority of them, end up in the basement end up in the boiler room because they delegate their intentionality to factors outside their control. They delegate it to those who pay them a salary or who tell them what to do. And it ends up that human intentionality part is done by the CEO or by some babu. And the engineer just builds a bridge where it was wanted or builds an airport where it was wanted, right? So that's part of the downside of it takes on and solves challenging hard problems, okay, build bridges, makes us fly, on and on and on, design, build and operate all kinds of things with modern society. And this is a short summary of where we were in terms of modern society in 2019. And of course, we were emitting lots of CO2 into the air. And you see some of the numbers there. In fact, uh, 2019, Anthropogenic carbon emissions were 100 times larger than the background natural carbon emissions by nature. So you are 100 fold out of balance with long term equilibrium of the environment. And what I want to draw your attention to are two significant words here. One is called carbon budget, right? And the carbon budget, now I got to rewind a little bit because maybe it's not something everybody in the room knows. Carbon budget is the amount of CO2 left, the room left in the atmosphere for additional emissions of CO2 before you hit a trigger point, 50% probability that you'll cross the trigger point. So the carbon budget for 1.5 degrees Celsius is tiny. It's going to be gone in six years. And the major emitters who have filled up the CO2 in the atmosphere, the, the Annex 1 countries, the industrialized countries, are not slowing down. Our CO2 emissions curve has relentlessly kept on increasing. And the carbon budget for two degrees C, by the way, because of statistical uncertainties and disagreements between models, the carbon budget is set for a 50% chance. You can look it up. So carbon budget for 50% chance of hitting two C is only 1200 gigatons of CO2, which means that at current emission rate of 50 gigatons of CO2 per year, even if we stop any further increase, which is relentless, unless there is a huge recession or something like that, or a COVID, right? At 50 gigatons per year, you got only 24 years left. And the reason two degrees Celsius is important is because lots of people believe, atmospheric scientists and environmental scientists believe that two degrees Celsius is a point where irreversible tipping points will be crossed such as a vast release of methane from the tundra, or such as uh, loss of ice caps uh, in Greenland and Antarctica, 
and they won't come back, at least for a few thousand years. So vast big sea level rises and so on. So in other words, time is run out already for 1.5 and is almost run out for two. So it looks like in your lifetime, my lifetime too, we are going to shoot past uh, 1.5 for sure and two and more. So that is one side of the picture, okay? So bear that in mind as we think about development engineering. The second side of the picture is something called planetary boundaries. Just to calibrate myself, how many of you have read about planetary boundaries? Raise your hands, please. Okay, maybe 10%. So, uh, environmental scientists have identified a place uh, or, 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 or trigger points or tipping points in different domains, in nine different domains, where human interference with the environment will cause irreversible harm of a magnitude where human civilization from scratch will be unable to restart. We have started at one point, we are here now, and for, suppose there was some magic, we were all wiped out, we could restart again in terms of having agriculture being discovered and so on, so long as there is a DNA of humankind left. But human civilization cannot be restarted if you exceeded that what is called safe operating space for humanity. Out of nine, six were exceeded in 2023. They are shown in red. And we push against those boundaries all the time, such as the loss of biodiversity, um, pollution with um, PFAS chemicals or plastics, you, you can read the details, all right? And this is the DOI for Science Advances 2023, which will give you more details if you like in terms of planetary boundaries. So the time remaining is short on one hand. In terms of CO2 alone, but it's also short in terms of actually bad things happening in terms of environmental stability around the planet in different dimensions. Now I come back to the subject matter of development engineering to be poverty. And the World Bank says, near destitute people, how many of them are there? Um, and where do they live? Okay. Just five countries account for 50% of the near destitute or destitute people on the planet. Then this starts with India, followed by others. This is from World Bank numbers, but this is just attributing it to countries as to where they live. More importantly to me is the issue of development, back to engineers taking on tough challenges, saying that if development is freedom, and if development is the loftiest of societal goals for developing countries, then I would argue that development is too bloody important to be left to non-engineers alone, okay? And the argument I make is not just a Martha sense argument, but also looking at what's the economic distribution on the planet. Here is the income distribution on the planet, ironically called the champagne glass of income, because it looks like the champagne glass, okay? Each thin black line represents a quantile or 20% of the population. This is for the whole planet, human beings. The bottom 20% earn 2% of the planetary income. All the way going up to the bottom 80% doesn't add up to much. And even that 70% for the top quintile you can see how skewed that distribution is in terms of income. So, again the argument is, the money is not trickling down. Development, healthcare, human rights are not trickling down. And uh, 
wealth distribution, well, here is the human development index in terms of human development index is compiled by the UNDP, United Nations Development Program. India falls down here, 80% or sorry, 0.8 and up is called very high human development. They are almost exclusively first world countries, uh, add up to about 1 billion people out of eight. India is, and there are many others who deserve to be up at, at 0.8 in terms of their healthcare, their education, in terms of their human rights, in terms of their literacy and opportunities to thrive to their potential. And they are not going to go up there with 24 years left for CO2 emissions or, or whichever way you want to look at it. And the wealth distribution is even worse. This number changes from year to year based on the number eight. Changes from year to year if you follow uh, Oxfam. The top number might, the, the eight riches might change to 10 or 15 or even 50 or 100. The point remains that the bottom 4 billion people have as much wealth as maybe the top 50. Okay? Now, this is a famous quote from Richard Feynman at the time of the Challenger disaster, but I love it because a lot of people get into development engineering because of PR. And Feynman's quote comes out of his analysis of the Challenger disaster, which the government wanted to suppress. And they refused to include his analysis that the Challenger disaster originated because of frozen O-rings on the, on the booster. So a great thing happened. Feynman wouldn't sign the main report and the government wouldn't let him write his conclusions in the main report. So they had to reach a compromise, which was that he was allowed to write an appendix F called personal observations by Richard Feynman, which attracted everybody's attention, much to the embarrassment of those who wanted his opinion to be suppressed. But the fact being, back to this relevance, is that development engineering is not about PR, which means that measuring whether you achieved what you wanted to achieve and being transparent about it, just like as you would be for any other engineering project, is part of the core of a discipline that we would like you to, to talk about, think about, practice. It is not about just feel good. It's not about charity. It's not about feeling good about yourself. It's about changing the world. And you can't fool anybody with that unless with, with somebody testing it with measurable outcomes. So here we have all the sustainable development goals agreed upon by the UN, signed upon by all countries. And some scholars are already saying that they're incompatible with keeping within the planetary boundaries. Because sustainable development goals were aspirational. That is what everybody wanted. Sure, kathastu, you know, let us have it, amen. But the question is, are they practical? Are you going to get there from here? It looks like we can't. And which also means that the, the argument that you should just tell the people, I shouldn't call them at the bottom of the pyramid because they're bottom 80% of the people. You saw that graph, the champagne graph, okay? Uh, to tell them to just wait until prosperity or well-being trickles down to them is bogus. There's this guy called Walt Rostow who talks about uh, the poor should wait for trickle-down prosperity so they will eventually get into a high human development level. Ideas or propaganda or promotion of ideas like that ignores the fact of neocolonialism. It ignores the fact that we have in the world military dictatorships installed in countries from where Resources have to be extracted, where human rights are trampled because, not because they will ever trickle down, because a particular, maybe multinational corporations wants to make sure 
that fruit out of Guatemala is not taxed by the Guatemalan government. Okay? So there is no trickle down and there is no time. So my argument is, look at what other people have done and other approaches, but we would like to argue that one needs to identify what are the constraints for poverty and one needs to identify what are the desperate problems of the bottom half of the world's population, which are not even on the horizon of the people in the first world or the elite in the developing world. Okay? The problems of safe drinking water or inhalation of smoke or children dying of cold are not on the horizon of the elite in the first world, oh, sorry, elite in the third world and common people in the first world. And development engineering aims to address those problems with technological innovation and ways to replicate it to have society scale impact and verify that the impact has been achieved. And it's okay if you did not achieve it because at least you declare that, sorry, this trajectory failed. Let the next person try something else. Okay? Trying and failing is not something to be ashamed about. Not even trying is the thing that I want to question. So a definition of development engineering is a discovery of technological solutions that sustainably and reproducibly improve development outcomes at scale. I tell my students, don't take on a problem for your PhD unless you can tell me with some persuasion that if you are successful technically, assuming you are, it's okay if you are not, at least 10 million people on the planet will benefit. Don't do boutique problems. Don't do something in the corner of a sandbox. Take on the problem if successful, if scaled up, will really make a difference. Now that is one of your selection screens, selection criteria of what problem you want to take on. And then you have to figure out how will you scale it up, okay? What it is not. It is not throwing money at a problem. Here is an example of the Millennium Villages. It's not examples like you have heard of Play Pump, the ridiculous project where children were given uh, these roundabout wheels and they were supposed to run around pushing the wheels around in circle, attached to which was a groundwater pump, with which they pumped the groundwater up into a tank, and thus you got children to pump water for the village. When I saw it, I knew it's not going to work. Children want to play. They are not some bullock type to go around thing called a play pump. The socket is like that. It is a soccer ball or football, as we call it, in India, uh, with an inertially positioned mass that charges a battery, so that if you kick around the ball, children kick around the socket ball, and then charge the battery, and then the adult plug in the uh, little socket and give LED light for their home, and big mess, doesn't work. Doesn't work in terms of, it's impractical. The kids don't want it. They just want to have fun. It's okay. Okay? So that's not what we want. Here are the defining features. It's got to be scalable. We talked about that. It is hypothesis based in the sense that your mindset is a learning mindset. You're willing to say, let me try this. Does it work? If it doesn't work, you're willing to say it didn't work. Okay? So it's a learning mindset. And the hypothesis is hard to read in the kind of white thing, but the hypothesis testing has a broad range. It includes randomized control trials if you have the resources and the time to do it. But if you don't, like in my case, when I was working on stoves for Darfur refugee women, I just had to decide things on the fly and try it out and it worked. But I didn't have time to do RCT. That's okay. Right? But now there are some 65,000 of those stoves in Africa. So this hypothesis-based 
who is channel agnostic because once you have a solution, how to take it to scale requires a channel. And the channel could be markets, startup, business, could be government, or could be nonprofits or nonprofit institutions, right? So we are not tied to saying, oh, all profit is bad, because hey, even malnourished children in Africa are fed Coca Cola because it, everybody makes a dime along the way, except the child, of course, and their mom who bought it. But point is, it just shows you the power of everybody making a dime along the way, right? So it's fine. If they make profit, that's what works, that what works. The whole world runs on making profit. So don't start with a mindset that it must be not for profit or it must be, we don't care. Solve the problem and move on, right? It should be generalizable and has to therefore have interdisciplinary breadth in your solution, you need to think not just about engineering, but about um, social sciences. And lastly, sustainable. Okay? So, broadly speaking, the approach is nested loops of innovation, implementation, evaluation, adaption, with actually testing at each loop, but also testing across the loops as you, as you have this circular learning curve that is hopefully a virtuous circle. And it doesn't have to be rigidly along that path. You could jump from A to B depending on what circumstances allow. Now that gives you a, a, a kind of background of why this book got written, the one which has 190,000 downloads by now. Uh, and it's open access, it is free. We paid a fee to make it open access. So the first four chapters, provide the introduction and the connection between technology and development and the framework about innovate, iterate and evaluate and the fourth chapter is about ethics and the next 19 chapters are categorized into six categories which is a matter of convenience but there are 19 case studies okay? and you can download it for free from here. So to start with the initial idea was we need to have technologies that are affordable. Technique. So this is now kind of getting into my trajectory, what I learned. This is what I thought. Saying, yeah, you know, this makes sense. Nobody can pick a quarrel with this. You got to have affordability. You got to have technically effectiveness. You'd be surprised how many technologies claim to work, but they don't because they are for the poor and the poor don't complain, you know. Particularly if you are at a non-profit and you take money from some donor and deliver something to the poor, the poor don't complain because that's what they got today. They may get something tomorrow, right? So they are quiet. The donor doesn't know any, board, any better. And the non-profit in between is in the field of making the donor feel good and giving something to the poor. So unless it is measurable to be technically effective, suspect it. And of course it must work outside the lab. Lots of things work in the lab. Working in the lab is a necessary condition, it's not a sufficient condition. Okay? So these are surely correct but completely inadequate. What I learned is that design thinking and implementation strategy cannot be separated. Your implementation strategy thinking needs to start when you start your thinking about the design. That requires you to go into spaces that for you and for me too at, at one time we are uncomfortable because I have a, I'm not trained as a businessman, I'm not even trained as an engineer. I'm trained as a physicist who kind of wandered into engineering looking at the time left for people from my country of origin to get some level of prosperity and getting really upset to feel at a gut level that we have no time left. And then being told that, oh, yeah, yeah, you wait, it will come to you and realizing that's BS. Secondly, social factors are critical, of course, for a technology success, as critical as those from engineering. And lastly, there's a huge amount of 
non engineering stuff that you must integrate in your thinking for implementation planning when you design the technology to figure out how is it going to go out and take root and multiply because any time you think there is a problem there is somebody else who is thinking oh this is wonderful this is great i am benefiting from it okay so you think somebody needs a bridge not the guy with the boat who is crossing the river he says i don't want a bridge i want my boat and i want to make money on it right so you got to figure out what's maintaining the status quo who's feeding this status quo and how am i going to maybe incorporate what they want so that at least we neutralize them all of that goes into your implementation thing so one requirement will summarize these three if you will which is articulate and critically examine your theory of change by critically examine i mean you yourself being hostile to your theory of change and trying to poke holes in it and ask other people to poke holes in it to say does it make sense will it work what's going on here right so if you have a theory of change then at least there is some hope that you will say oh that's not right something went wrong here a doesn't follow on to b right it refers to how to you know intervention will result in a positive societal outcome activities lead to social impact and that connectivity between your actions and societal impact is the theory of change it shows the causal relationship between the steps articulates assumptions forces you to decide what to do and what not to do what you want to achieve and identify necessary factors for your theory to work schematically one would say you have control on your activities and therefore you can choose your inputs and if you are successful you will get some outputs but the outputs have to lead to an outcome which is different from simply the output i design a machine to disinfect water the outcome has to be in the real world delivery of that water in somebody's cup when they want to drink it and not get diarrhea okay but from there it has to lead to impact so there is a lot of causal forces involved in going from the activity and my control on the inputs and my diligence to produce an output once i go to the outcome there are external forces that support it or oppose it much like the guy with the boat who doesn't really want to bridge on the river okay and then impact too so if you want to read more by the way there is a whole lot of stuff i think i did mention it wikipedia has a lot of writing on that but it's very common in the social sciences so i'm going to as i said give you only two illustrative innovations about safe drinking water for about a billion people who don't have it and then um, again it comes back to water about arsenic removal and their water supplies so context is lots of people don't have safe drinking water about 2 million annual deaths mostly of children below age 5 here is a little girl 5 year old asma and her mother in uh, dhaka hospital the largest most modern hospital in dhaka is called cholera hospital because that's how prevalent cholera is it was established by uh, international agencies for international center ic dd is diarrheal disease research bangladesh the idea was they will build ic ddr in multiple locations but they built only one the one in dhaka okay and the girl is dehydrated and the mom is given a gruel of boiled rice to feed sugar and boiled rice to feed to the girl and as we were watching the girl was pushing away the bowl all the time and asked my daughter who was at, at that time an intern in the hospital saying he <laughs> explained what's going on and she said dehydrated kids are extremely irritable they don't ever want to even drink water and they go into a spiral that leads to death but that's what like counter intuitive stuff happens um the whole hospital is covered with 
or the whole hospital is covered with beds, all the beds are covered with a rubber sheet because all the patients in the hospital have diarrhea and they don't want to wash their beds all the time. This whole thing is worth visiting if you go to Dhaka. Now I ended up designing something uh, as a result of a cholera epidemic in uh, Bihar. And 10,000 people died of diarrhea, cholera in Bihar in the month of May that year. And I was doing some aerosol science and uh, at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab and I was getting frustrated because I was doing something that really felt irrelevant relative to the scale of what people in my home country were undergoing. And I said, there's got to be a better way to provide them with safe drinking water that they can afford. And I set up some design criteria, but what I'm going to list you here is not just the design criteria, but also what I achieved at the end of the design. It's pretty simple design. The funny thing is nobody worried about it. That's why I ended up doing it. I used to say to myself that a high school physics teacher could have done what I did, but the high school physics teacher doesn't have a lab or resources. And the engineers are trying to make a better toothpaste or build the God knows what, the, the new app for the iPhone and 10,000 people are dying every month. That's the kind of irony that makes you crazy, saying what is going on? What are we doing? So 60 watts, like a table lamp in those days, disinfects a ton of water. Can you must use only reliable, mature components, must be robust, must treat unpressurized water collected by uh, in a bucket. 12 seconds is the maximum time. There's no overdose risk very simple maintenance and must be fail safe. So anything breaks, it should stop delivering water, which means there's automatic built-in guarantee that if the water does come through, there it goes. So we build this, we tested it in the lab, we tested it first in uh, India, Uttar Pradesh, Bhuvaneswar, uh, Mexico, uh, South Africa, uh, in KwaZulu Natal, um, and the lab design and tests were completed in 96. This is what the device looks like. I also had to look at why previous devices failed. It basically works by destroying the DNA of the pathogens, both viruses and bacteria with UVC radiation, 254 nanometers. The, the radiation that you make with in all tube lights is very cheap to make. Any country, any factory that can make tube lights can make UVC radiation with low pressure mercury arc in copious quantities. And it is extremely effective in destroying back, uh, DNA. And the reason that happens also is because ozone layer protects all life on Earth from UVC reaching the Earth's surface. So our DNA never had to be exposed to UVC. We could allow that Achilles heel to happen. But now we have UVC manufacturing capacity to destroy the DNA of pathogens and other, other bacteria and viruses. So it's about the size of a kitchen microwave oven. And factory production, this is made in the factory, year 2000. Here is a woman at, uh, collecting water, one of the 10 trips she makes from that tank in Bominapadu. That was the place where we first built our first commercial dispensing or selling station for profit by a licensee. And this is what that looks like in 2005. Uh, people come to collect the water and it's sold. You see what the inside looks like. It is taken from a nearby lake. The water at that time sold for 10 paise per liter or one rupee per liter. Slowly the price has gone up to about six rupees for 10 liters. You have to buy only 10 liters. You can't buy smaller amounts, but people buy it. Okay, this pays back the bank. In some time after that, all money goes to the village council. The whole, the land is owned by the village council. The property is owned by the village council. The loan <coughs> is paid back, becomes village property. Two part-time employees, it got lots of prizes, but that doesn't matter, as we already said. 
in Ghana, it's, it was in five countries. But the place where the most of the installations are, there are a few hundred, not as many as I would have hoped, are in India. In the 500th center opened in 2012. But we cracked a hard problem because 80% of their customers are below the poverty line of the Indian government as measured by this Sambodhi, which is a market research organization. In 2015, it was saving about 2,000 statistical lines. No longer a charity and go to scale on its own. For most customers, the first time they drink water that is safe at a price that they can afford. There's lots of details, but I'll leave that for Q&A. Second is actually work in progress only because the Indian work is complete. This technology is also licensed to an Indian for-profit company called LivePure, and they provide say arsenic safe drinking water to about 5,000 people in a place called Dabdapi, which is two hours drive from Calcutta. Uh, and then they built a second replicate in Uttar Pradesh near Nepal border. Oh, by the way, all the work that I discuss here and all the work I've ever done is always been teamwork. So when I say I did it or so on, it doesn't mean I. It always means me plus a whole bunch of others whose list is too long to show here, but without them, I couldn't have achieved any of this stuff. Okay, so as you know, there was a massive switch to tube wells in Bangladesh and India. There were 10 million in Bangladesh alone. Now comes the interesting part. In folks in environmental engineering, there is something called maximum contaminant level, MCL. This is the MCL uh, this is showing the excess cancer risk, lifetime excess cancer risk by drinking water contaminated at the MCL of these permitted carcinogens, one at a time, okay? So just to give example, ethylene dibromide at its MCL, lifetime consumption causes 12 excess cancers in 100,000 people. Right? This graph is straightforward. This is taken from science, from Alan Smith's work. And now I'm going to change the scale and show you arsenic at its MCL. I change the scale. So these things have almost disappeared. That's arsenic at its MCL. 712 cancers per 100,000 people at a level permitted by the WHO. Thank you. And horrible consequences for those who don't die. Internal cancers always means in rural areas, too late to detect. People had given donations of filters, which within one year had failed. 95% of them failed within one year because there was no societal integration. These technologies all worked in the lab, but nobody had thought about the theory of change. Who will maintain it? Who will replace their adsorbent? Who will be responsible for collecting a small fee to replace whatever has to be replaced, okay? So we ended up doing something where we dissolve iron with a small DC current, produce Fe2 in the water, Fe2 turns to Fe3, Fe3 hydrates, becomes Fe3 oxides, captures phosphates, silicates, and arsenic, uh, coagulates, settles out, and you get clean drinking water. So I'll skip all this stuff. We build this big prototype in Jadapur University with my two students. Both of them have finished their PhD long ago now. This was tested in the school. You see the test in the school uh, at WWP High School. Here is the results. You see that starting with 250 ppb, we got less than five ppb in WWP over several months. Nobody was allowed to drink that water. Throw it away. Uh, then we scaled that up. And now you see the reactor size behind me over there in the blue tank. 
There are two reactors like that, and they produce enough water, 10,000 liters a day, um, and it's clean, and uh, people get electronic um, cars with which they collect it, students and staff get it free in exchange for giving us a room to build this. Up to this point, nobody got to drink the water on that side. After we are confident, then they got to drink the water here. We are well below WHO MCL, raw water still 250 ppb. We handed that off to a private sector licensee in January of 2017, and they have been running it ever since, providing safe drinking water for a fee, and then they replicated that one. So the lifetime cancer risk went from 18,000 all the way down to about 0.7 per 100 at 10 ppb. And actually this water is even less than that. And it's financially viable and scalable, not serving more than 10,000 people, 5,000 in UP and 5,000 in West Bengal. But we made a point that it works. It's scalable, it's, value, it's, it's valid, it works for five years on its own. So recap of the lessons learned is define your theory of change. End of slides, that's where I want to stop. But I do want to talk about at least poor economics and the poverty trap is one of the important things I try to tell my students that don't blame the poor, realize from work that is accessible to you, from Nobel laureate economists who wrote it for you to read, that there is something called poverty trap. And it's experimentally proven by people who are just academics, that people who are trapped in poverty indeed are actually trapped there. A small perturbation will return them back to the poverty equilibrium point. And there are ways to move them out, one of which is to use your engineering or development engineering skills to kick them off that equilibrium point to get them to the next equilibrium point. Okay? I think there's a whole bunch of goofball things, but I want to stop here. I will take questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you so much, Professor Gandhi, for that absolutely amazing sure. talk. And so many insights and so much interesting work. So we'll open the house up for uh, questions, and like we do in Sitara, we uh, give the first chance to students uh, within Sitara. It's often very, very difficult to get Sitara some chance, but maybe others. Uh, yeah, good evening, sir. My my name is Akash Prastava, and I'm a second year master's student here at Satara. So, sir, my query is regarding capacity building that we are having in terms of this development engineering. So, like, uh, sir, according to you, as per whatever case studies you went to on ground and on paper as well, what do you think like are the best strategy for capacity building so that we could have that maintenance cycle all over in our project? Like, just wanted to know the best strategy for the capacity building is something. Good question. Uh, I think, let, let me understand, let me make sure I understand your question right. By capacity building, you mean the ability of the intended beneficiaries or intended target population to socially integrate the technology in their daily life. Sure. Ah, okay. Good question. Good question. So, if I understand right, the question is capacity building to the level of self-sufficiency in the organization, in the community. No, I do not aim for it, and I want to argue forcefully against it. When I use this ballpoint pen and it runs out, I don't try to fill it with ink. I buy a refill, okay? And there is a reason why I buy a refill. My argument is to, to think about some misguided, I claim it misguided, 
idea of Gandhian self-sufficiency at a community level means I make my own cloth with my own hand spun fiber and I stitch my own shirt and I stitch my own shoes and I have no time left. This is not how it works. The reason we are in this room is not because the somebody self-sufficiently does it. We divide and conquer. We have skills which are highly specialized. And these highly specialized skills allow us to do what we do best on scale, with economies of scale, with amazing economies of scale, right? If you read the Communist Manifesto by Karl Marx, he praises capitalism for discovering this truth. He effusively praises it because it is not feudal anymore. It is not handicraft. It is industrial production. That's how we'll get out of that HDI problem. That's my thinking. Not by utopian community level self-sufficiency. Yeah, Any, anyone else? Any other question? My question to you would be on the point you raised about industrial capitalism as well as community growth. I wanted to know from your experience what would you say is the balance between these two? Because what we've understood, at least in the past and also while living, is that capitalism is inherently exploitative. And when you talk about communities, you cannot, again, as you said, complete self reliance, but there's again some equilibrium that exists between these two states. Totally. Of course. No, no, I, 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 tot no, I totally agree that uncontrolled capitalism, unregulated markets are brutal and monstrously exploitative and money only flows uphill under unregulated markets and brutal naked capitalism. So it doesn't mean when I, when I praise profit making or I said industrial production, it, I didn't at all mean to imply that we should worship at the foot of the god of market. No, no, no. It's got to be, it's got to be a force that is controlled. It's not the market should control us. Totally, I agree. Yes, of course. No, I think I meant that we've always talked about, for example, the invisible hand that is supposed to regulate the market, but it is again given. And the invisible hand is bogus. Every, that's BS. Yeah, that somebody said it long time ago. Everybody who watches what happens knows that is BS. It doesn't work like that. Okay? Only people who are extreme right wing nuts and Rand fans would love that. Okay? Allow me to be blunt because I am the speaker here. <laughs> but. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, anyone else? Why do you say the arsenic uh, is working problem? Because it's already succeeded in the, in the trial that we saw. So, the arsenic filtration process, why do you say that it works in progress? Oh, I say it is work in progress because. I'm not a businessman, so the licensee, which is Lipur, chose to invest their resources in far more profitable directions of growth for their company, which is under sink reverse osmosis for middle class Indians. That is their big market, that's the most profitable thing they're doing. So they completely ignored this thing about, they said, you know what? Rural marketing is a whole lot of headache. Middle class, urban, this is for only taste. They take municipal water, run it through RO, waste half of the water in the sink, and give you water at 300 or 250 ppm, right? That's where they make the most money. So in my sense, is work in progress in the sense that nobody has, by the way, that license is not exclusive. Anybody else could pick it up and run with it. But nobody has done that. 
And Lupior has only built one more plant in Uttar Pradesh, in a, in a town called Baharaich. So I will say work in progress from that perspective, not a scientific one. Now there is arsenic problem in California too. And I'm focused on how, in, how to make this work in California in a way that is affordable to the local community. So that's a whole different research branch I did not address. But you know what? If there are 80 million Indians who are dying of arsenic at that high level, and only 10,000 are able to do sustainably so far, not terribly happy about the outcome, but it's not under my control. And how do you take it to scale in rural markets? What, what is your... I need to work with people maybe who know that better than I do because I can't, I don't have the knowledge and the bandwidth to do everything. Maybe there are people in IIMs, maybe there are people in um, some rural development programs, uh, maybe there are people in Sitara with uh, some business interest who want to take it to scale. I talk to people uh, who are in that business, a number of them, but the nonprofits in India are in general extremely reluctant to do anything technical. They are terrified of technical stuff. Yes, sir. I will try with hundreds and hundreds of people in India to get them convinced about using this technology and doing it. And as he knows, I have been miserable. Yeah, there is interesting a... Gives them no money. Well, it makes money, it is profitable, but not as profitable as other avenues. So, so there is a branch of profitable business called social enterprise, where the goal is to make some money, but not maximum money. And those kind of enterprises often get investment from pension funds, who also have a societal objective. There are complicated things like that that happen definitely in the United States, and I don't know if they happen in India, but here we build huge temples, you know, when we are not short of temples. And we don't do this kind of stuff when we are short of this kind of stuff. I have two specific questions. One is how does this uh, new water uh, compare with ultra filtration on the ground? There is no, yeah, okay, go on. That's question one. Yeah, second one is, uh, I understand you have done some work on fluoride contamination. Yes. In certain parts of Maharashtra, especially Maharashtra, Nanded area, a lot of people are affected with sure. uh, uh, this fluoride contamination. Sure, about, yeah. yeah. Focus, uh, is there a viable solution? Means there may be some research uh, work and all that, but that has already been come out as a product or a solution that can be implemented, as you said, in practice. So, question number one was about ultrafiltration. And sure, ultrafiltration requires ultrafiltration membrane, which can be attacked by fungi or biofilms and bacteria, which you need to eliminate before the water reaches your ultrafiltration membrane. UV water work does not try to remove dissolved solids. So, it does not require any pressure. So you don't require any expensive membrane to change. You don't need to super clean the water in advance. So of course, if your water is uh, very brackish, you do need to get rid of the brackishness and you'll end up using RO. But that depends on the water. I'm not tying it down to have to use RO every time. Okay, that's the first answer. Regarding fluoride, we worked on fluoride thinking that we have a solution. We have a, about 200 million people around the world are affected with high levels of fluoride in their drinking water. About 60 million of them are in India, not just Maharashtra, there is Rajasthan, there is a lot of arid areas. We found that bauxite can be heat treated to turn it into a really effective and low cost fluoride adsorbent, except Indian bauxite. 
Okay, that's, we, we figured out why. Indian bauxite has a tiny amount of calcium in it. All other bauxite in the world, from Africa to United States to Latin America, bauxite is abundant around the Earth's surface. Doesn't have calcium. And that tiny amount of calcium, when you heat treat the bauxite, only 300 Celsius, okay, very cheap, makes the water pH go up. Calcium hydroxide, calcium oxide, right, pushes the water pH up. When the water pH goes up, bauxite stops grabbing fluoride. So you have to acidify that with maybe some dilute HCl or something like that, which is also dirt cheap. But I'm not into doing it on the ground because my feet are not on the ground here, right? But if you have Indian bauxite powdered, heat treated at 300, and really dilute HCl to counter the calcium, you will remove fluoride for sure. So we know how to do it, and we've proven it, and we published it in public domain, not even patented. Anybody can run with it. But are you tired of this like uh, non-profit or for a profit or anything that can take it to the people? Uh, question is, have I tied up with a non-profit that can take it to the people? The short answer is no. My skill set is on inventing and innovating and trying to make things affordable in principle, quote unquote. I'm not a businessman. Everybody to their own skills, you know, specialization, right? But at least I take it to the point where I would tell you it won't work, or I will say, here, it works. Now somebody else has to run with it. My name is Duke. I'm a PhD student from Dutch Columbia Department. Uh, thank you very much Bob, for this very impactful lecture. So, as someone from African descent, uh, this topic especially where you started from with regards to climate uh, change and the rest. It's always elicit some questions in my mind. Sure. And the fact that uh, the developed world always push around the narrative, permit me to use the word push around, the narrative of climate change, they are developed. And then you are developing world. I mean, most of them still at a very low level of quality. Sure. My question is this, twofold. Is the world really ready for the develop for the developing world to be developed, knowing that if we push the boundary of development, there is a consequent impact on climate. Currently, the way the world is going, even by the emission of the developed world, you emphasize that in 24 years we're going to be hitting some limits, right? So do you expect the developing world to remain the way they are? That's I mean, if they are to develop. Contributing to what the developed world is also doing, there is likely to be you know, a compounded impact on climate. Secondly, um, talking about poverty, okay, the, I'm beginning to think that the developed world, in a way, has an underlining, uh, you know, hand stretch to the developing world in attempting to keep them in that state. Hopefully for their benefit, and you mentioned something similar to that, having a company go there, mine without paying tax and all of that. So could we, could we say that these other countries are deliberately ensuring that the developing countries are not developed? Because even the, the whole idea of corruption and every of these things happening, it's as if it's an entire gameplay thing. Because if corruption continues, poverty will continue, like you mentioned in one of your slides. So it's a very complicated thing to me. I don't know if you can uh, kind of provide, give me some of your thoughts. Boy, uh, I, I give you, obviously, what I think. It's difficult to test what I think to be true or not true because it's just a conclusion or an impression. And I'll answer your second question first because it is the harder of the two. I think in general, the power of finance capital globally is so vast, larger than the annual GDP. Their, their throughput is larger than the annual GDP of many countries. 
or even individual wealth, you saw that, is so vast, that it is not necessary to really assign intentionality to state actors always. There is plenty of corruption going around. There is, as Amulya Reddy used to say, there is first there is global south in the physical north, in the slums of United States, there is global south, and there is global north in the elites of the physical south also. So the it is intertwined. It's hard to say it is always the state actors that do that. It could be Rio Tinto, the, the big mining company, that is poisoning the mines in Chile or Bolivia. And if needed, they can go to the US embassy and say, oh, put some pressure here or do something else. But there are enough people with enough profit motives or enough selfishness going around that you don't need, it to, don't need to think about it as a, at least I don't think of it as a state actors only. It's not like British colonialism on, or, or pre-Second World War colonial powers, which were explicit in having British flag in Delhi flying on what is today the presidential palace. It's not like that. It's more complicated and subtle. Yeah? In terms of your first question, is it, is it if, I, if let me rephrase it, or let me, you're asking, is it indeed acceptable to the developed countries that developing countries will remain underdeveloped. Is that a question? Is that correct? When they are to develop, what is the impact of their development by industry? Oh, sure. If the, industry, if the developing countries actually develop using current known technologies and take the slow train to development, which is simply increase GDP without targeting desperate problems in prioritizing. Climate will be blown to bits, I think. Okay, we'll be way out of control. We can't manage it. So in some sense, there has to be environmental justice between the industrial north and the developing countries who did not take up the atmospheric space for all the CO2 that we did not emit because we did not industrialize, particularly in Africa. And that environmental justice cannot be ignored. And it's really important that, I mean, in, in the United States, in the fight against racism, one slogan that resonates with me is no justice, no peace, okay? Peace without justice is oppression. It's only with justice that you can have peace. And that includes environmental justice, that's what I think. But then, that's what I think. Whereas the demand for environmental justice must come from those to whom it has been denied. Primarily, I could support it as a person living in the first world. There are a lot of people in the first world who think environmental justice is important. But there has to be the groundswell from the people who, for, from whom the environmental justice has been denied. Does that make sense to you? Yeah? Yeah. yeah. Um, so, at the back of the room. Also, please introduce yourself, sir. Yeah. Uh, I just have two questions or observations. So can you introduce yourself? Sir? Yeah. I am Shashank Tirak, an alumnus of this place. Two questions or observations. Yeah. Number one, you said that number of cases, the ability to maintain is a key issue. And having the technical or the wherewithal, make sure that the equipment or things that you provided have been maintained does not uh, make that thing scalable or it can't be spread so widely because this aspect of maintenance becomes a key issue, which a key hindrance. Now in that case, will that make sense? Will it make sense to include that capability? At least definition of that capability so, as part of your overall 
projects. Absolutely, yes. In fact, uh, I mean, I did not, I did not say the way you seem to have summarized it. Uh, I would like to argue that even every small village in India, even at the time of independence, had what we call lalten, you know, a lantern, a kerosene lantern. And they could maintain it. And soon after independence, every village had a bicycle, though they could not make it, but they could maintain it. So ways in which you could replace a spoke in the wheel of a bike, the spoke they could not make. They could not make steel. They don't have to make a rubber tire. They need to be able to patch it. They need to be able to replace the spoke when it breaks, right? Things like that. Sure. In other words, pretty much like the model of the hand pump in Thelonia model, there are levels of maintenance and more sophisticated maintenance requires more sophisticated engineering support. The lowest level of support can be, can be done by local community as, as you are arguing, but to put the entire burden of maintenance for that hand pump all the way onto the community is, is not needed and it's not done. That's not how businesses work. Actually businesses have figured it out even for a lantern or a bike or a pressure cooker or a primer stove and so on. Yeah, in a way, you articulated it much better. What I meant was that definition or application of a technology should be at such a level that ideally it can be maintained by that lowest level capability that is required. I mean, you mentioned about UV light being made by anyone who can make, who is making two lights. Yeah. That's a perfect example I can think of. Yeah. So I think that definition or translation to a technology which is reasonable enough for the lowest level is a better definition problem. And you have and a tiered approach. So right. that depends on what level of maintenance is needed. If a fuse is blown, the local electrician will likely put a, a piece of aluminum from a cigarette sure. <laughs> in place sure. of the fuse wire and make it work. Okay. Sure. Uh, my second observation was about the bauxite being used for removing the fluoride contents. And you mentioning that to take care of calcium, you would use very highly diluted hydrochloric acid. Cheap, cheap, that's all. Yeah. yeah. Uh, my question is that ultimately it's going to be calcium chloride, which I believe is again going to be soluble and going to create different kind of problems. Will carbonic acid work better? Because ultimately carbonic acid will convert that calcium oxide to calcium carbonate, which is insoluble. And in that sense, probably eliminate a lot more problems. Has sure. that been explored? It, no, that we have not. You are ex exactly right. If you had a pressurized CO2, a tank of pressurized CO2, and you pass the, you make the water acid, acid, acidify the water with CO2, maybe it will work, we didn't try it. And that's what I just wanted to tell no, Perfect, you. and there, there is a lot of work to be done. We didn't even re design the reactors for making it work in, in India on, on the field. Right, and we have time for one more question. Is there, I see hand, okay, two more questions. One at the back, the lady at the back. You can introduce yourself and then gentlemen in the front. Yeah, please. Uh, hello, sir. So, my name is Roshti Hamra. I am a fifth year geology student from NIT Science Department. I have a question regarding the carbon budget that you mentioned in your first slide. So, you know, uh, there is a lot of debate going on uh, about the other things, the carbon budget to develop countries and developing countries. Basically, should the other carbon budget based on the country level or carbon budget per capita? For example, if you allot per capita, thing, so the Indian, the countries like India will get more carbon budget compared to the developed countries. So, what is your op opinion on this? Like, how should you allot the carbon budget to the countries? Please allot any which way but move forward. <laughs> there is actually a very good argument. Uh, an op opinion piece appeared in one prominent US newspaper, an ironical one, saying what would be the topic for debate in the 50th COP, you know, 50th Conference of Parties of UNFCCC. The topic for debate would be now that the Antarctica has melted, we want to build some casinos on it. 
And maybe we should debate in the UNFCCC, in the COP, who should, how should we divide the profits from the casinos equitably while we let the world burn? That's how useless my generation has been in making a dent in the carbon emissions curve. We have been totally outwitted. It's not like my generation didn't try, but we have been totally outwitted by the fossil industry lobbies, by the fossil industry propaganda people, by the politicians bought by the fossil industry, and outwitted. We lost. We blew it. And I feel terrible, my colleagues and friends also feel terrible that we are handing to you, the younger generation, an outrageously unfair burden to deal with this garbage. We screwed up in a way that is not, it is not supposed to be like this. We have been talking about this damn thing since 1992. Okay? There is no need to talk and talk and talk and fly all around the world giving speeches. And what I, what I often think, in some ways parallel to what I talked about the oppressed, is that there is a problem of intergenerational robbery from the younger generation by my generation, because we just wasted time talking while Rome burned and we are handing the ashes to you. That is called intergenerational robbery, right? That's how bad it is. It's totally unfair, totally wrong, and you have every right to be furious about it. And don't take bullshit for answer. I have a last question. Hello, sir. I'm a PhD student yeah. uh, in Sanctuary Nanosphere Technology. So my question is about the uh, heavy metals like fluoride, arsenic that we have and most of the fluoride that is coming from the groundwater like salt, uh, rock is there and it's coming out and we are using membranes, materials and all these different technologies but even these materials that we use as absorbent it's concentrated uh, the heavy metal uh, in that form and the membrane is also concentrating water with the heavy metal but they are still there but we are not going for final remediation with that heavy metals that we have. So they are keep on continuously coming on the surface and it's still there like the absorbent we use. After some time it is leached and again comes to the uh, surface water. So how we can go for it like for final treatment of the Good, good question. In, in uh, uh, posed in a slightly different language, you are asking how can a toxic contaminant like arsenic be removed in a way that does not re-poison the water or re-poison the environment. How, how do you immobilize it? And actually one of my slides was going to be about it. Work done both in Jadapur University and in the US on immobilizing sludge, that is the iron oxyhydroxides to which arsenic is bound, from which we do not want that arsenic to be again reintroduced in the environment, is to mix it with cement and cast it into maybe tiles or cast it into boundary walls. So long as you don't bury it into anoxic soil, it is going to remain immobilized. Even if you crush it, grind it, it will not come loose from the bound state because it is covalently bound to the ferric oxyhydroxides. So long as you don't remove the oxygen and push it into a reduced environment, which means you keep it as a boundary wall or something like that, it is completely possible to immobilize it very long time. In the US also, the approach is don't make liquid waste, make solid waste, immobilize the solid waste because you can't get rid of atoms. Ultimately, you got cadmium. What are they going to do? You don't need that much cadmium, right? It's too dilute to extract it for cadmium cells or stuff like that, but it's too toxic to be left around. So you have to immobilize it in solids and then keep it in dry chemical waste, dry toxic chemical waste uh, repositories. Okay. One final question. Yeah. Yeah. 
So uh, thanks for this really good talk. Um, just one sort of question uh, comment that uh, so the two technologies that you uh, presented here really great, uh, very uh, good, um, great outcomes. Uh, but it's harder to find these kind of uh, technologies or point solutions which are new technology almost. I mean, may not be new science, but certainly new technology. Uh, but there are many, uh, you know, low hanging, not low hanging fruit, but implementation of engineering thinking or solutions to just current systems can lead to large improvements, but they are not new technology. So just better design of transportation systems, which is an analysis problem. Sure. Sure. What do you, uh, so that, I mean, development engineering, like there, there's a large swath Exactly. Of value to be tapped into. Absolutely, absolutely. Of, uh, no, no, I totally agree with you. In fact, if you look at uh, even the case studies, there are examples about improving access to the market, which is not new technology in any which way. Or there are examples of ensuring that an election in Pakistan is actually not rigged. Okay, so there are digital technologies which are improving social processes like a market in terms of fairness of access or in an election which are not tied to novelty or new kind of anything, but using it for the goal of development. Because in some ways, it is the most audacious enterprise for a society to undertake. And it is crazy to leave it to a game of quote unquote normal economic functioning and let, let chance uh, be uh, the, the decision maker as to what outcome we face. Yeah, 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 absolutely, yeah, yeah, very much so. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you so much, sir. Thank you, uh, my pleasure. Can I request all of us to give him a big hand for your time and your ideas and analysis and your provocation, actually. So I'm not going to add again request, uh, Professor Agni Uthri. So the former head is asking the current head, the current head said ask the former head now. I as a faculty member there am so can I invite both of you? So let's solve that problem at one go. Please come. So we have there's a little gift from the institute as a token of Oh my god, okay. So from that means we just come to you. That one from Anandita. Thank you. So let and both the heads roll. Okay. And this is a little uh, Sitara speciality. This is a Khadi scarf from Madan Sangrala in Vardha. Wow. Set up by Kumar Appa, who is Gandhi's economist. Thank you, sir. So this is a little bit Kumar. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I would uh, like to also thank everyone who's made this absolutely fascinating talk possible. Uh, firstly, the institute, uh, director of the institute, the PRO's office, who has coordinated everything, informed all of us. And we had a very good audience today, so clearly we did something well. Uh, the transportation department that helped Professor come, uh, people at the VNCC, uh, and of course at the guest house where, where they say, hope you had a good stay. Yeah, uh, excellent. Thank you so much for coming, and uh, it's been a privilege. My great time. pleasure to be here, by the way, and thank you so much for coming here and asking questions, and it was a lively discussion. I enjoyed your questions, and um, what else can I say? You guys are a powerhouse. And um, I'm really happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So please join me for refreshments. Uh, thank you very much, everyone.